worship service here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. We are so glad that you have decided to join us for worship this morning. We know that you have a myriad of choices when it comes to your online worship experience. And again, on this third Sunday in January, we are so very pleased that you have tuned in to worship with us. We remind each other that indeed this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you to center yourself as we prepare to go into worship, as we prepare to allow God's spirit to reign over our hearts and minds, as we allow the Lord to minister to us collectively and individually. It is my prayer uh, that when worship has concluded, you will have had a transformative worship experience and are better for your encounter with God. Let us prepare our hearts and minds again to go into our worship service as we begin with our call to worship, followed by our morning prayer, our scripture reading, then of course our preface to the Decalogue, summary of the Decalogue, and Apostles' Creed. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for our call to worship. All-knowing God, we gather this day in your name to worship you. We give thanks that there is a small spark of God within each of us. You knit us together in the womb. Wonderful are your works. Enduring God, we gather this day in your name to worship you. We celebrate your loving presence in our lives. In your book were written all the days that were formed for us when none of them yet existed. Understanding God, we gather this day in your name to worship you. We praise you for all that is fearfully and wonderfully made. May your loving presence be a strong influence in our lives. May we remember that you are always with us. Amen. Let us now prepare ourselves for our morning prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come on this third Sunday in January. We come, God, rejoicing for the fact that we have an opportunity to live. We come rejoicing, O oh God, that you have quickened our spirits this morning. We come rejoicing, O oh God, that as we slept last night, you watched over and protected, protected us. We come rejoicing, O oh God, this morning you quickened our spirits and allowed us, God, to now come in to worship you. We thank you, God, for prayers that were answered. We thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. We thank you, God, for healing that has come. We thank you, Lord, for deliverance that has come. We thank you, Lord, for those who are in financial distress, but, God, you made a way for them to pay bills. We thank you, God, for those who are lying in sick beds, but, God, you've allowed them to come home. We come, oh God, thank you for those who have had distress in their life, trying to find direction, oh God, but you gave them direction. God, we come thanking you. We come rejoicing, oh God. We come celebrating your, your name. We come celebrating our freedom and our victory because of Jesus Christ. We come also, God, uh, in a spirit of thanksgiving for those who may be going through bereavement, God, as you comfort them. We ask, oh God, that you would send your comforting Holy Spirit, helping them understand, oh God, that death does indeed come, but God, eternal life comes after that. We come, oh God, ask that you would ease their pain, God. We come, Lord, asking that you would bring understanding and, and comfort and healing to their hearts and minds. We come, oh God, because you are the source of our strength, God. You are the source of our joy, Lord. You are the source of our happiness, God. You are the source of all that we have and need to move through this world. And so, God, we come thanking you, God, asking, Lord, as we go through our worship experience, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will continue to reverberate in our hearts and minds, that your, your love, oh God, will continue to wrap its arms around us, and continue, oh God, to minister to us. We come, oh God, seeking your word today, oh God, that it also may give us strength for the day's journey. This, oh God, is our prayer in your Son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. Uh, yes, we thank the Lord for the chance to hear his written word this morning. Our scripture readings are coming from the 139th Psalm and also the book of 1 Corinthians. Old Testament reading, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I invite you to join us as we read this scripture. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down 
and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. We praise God for the reminder of God's infinite wisdom and for God's all-knowing ability of everything in our lives. Our New Testament scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the first Corinthians, or to the Corinthian church, rather, his first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. First Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Let us now hear again the word of God from the New Revised Standard Version. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will raise us by and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Amen. We praise God for a reminder of how our actions indeed have consequences and how we should pursue God in all of our thoughts and activities. Amen. Uh, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for our preface to the Decalogue, the summary of the Decalogue, and the Apostles' Creed. From all that dwell below the skies, let the Creator's praise arise. of Christ our Savior when he was asked what is the greatest commandment and he said to him you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all of your mind this is the first and great commandment the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets I believe in God the Father Almighty the maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We are so happy always uh, to be able to remind ourselves of God's commandments, particularly as we remind ourselves of the commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And also to remind ourselves of what indeed we believe that is so critical to our foundation as Christians to know what it is that we believe. And so we're grateful every time we can repeat the Apostles' Creed and the preface and summary of the Decalogue. 
Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for a wonderful selection from our choir, after which we will have our sermon for today. Certainly, uh, so very happy. The 
choir reminds us of God's promises to us, reminding us of, of what we have to look forward to, uh, that heaven indeed is our home. God has a promised land for us, and we should always be ever mindful of that. Even as we go through difficult times here on this side of heaven, we should always have our hearts and minds focused on the reward that God has for us. It helps us uh, deal with so many other issues as we live our lives. Uh, that's an encouraging word for us this morning. A uh, selection from our choir to remind us of what God indeed has in store for us. I want to direct your attention uh, to our scripture text for this morning. I read it as part of our New Testament scripture reading, but want to read it again, coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. That'll be our sermon text for today. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles uh, there along with us or to view it on the screen. Now, let us hear God's word. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we come now thanking you for the opportunity to hear your word. We come, O oh God, with opportunity for you to feed us from on high. We come, O oh God, asking that you would send your word Allow your word, O oh God, to transform us and allow us, O oh God, to be different than how we were when we first began our worship experience this morning. Allow, O oh God, our hearts and minds to focus on where we are and not where we have to be. Bless us now, God, as I pray in your Son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. I want to focus on a theme this morning of the basics of Christian behavior the basics of Christian behavior. Uh, we have been dealing this year with how to live our best life in this year. We started out uh, the year with a sermon around how to protect our future, reminding us that this year is our future, and God has laid out a tremendous destiny for us in 2021, and it's up to us to protect that. We followed up with a reminder of how Jesus can help us with that protecting. As we looked at the resume of Jesus and, and saw the many wonderful things that he brings into our lives. And so as we talk about uh, protecting our future, we understand we also have a role to play in taking advantage of the power that Jesus gives us. And part of that is changing our behavior. Now, this is not an indictment or accusation about how anyone lives, but simply an acknowledgement that we should know what Christian behavior looks like. And if we see what is expected of us and our behavior lines up with it, then you're going the right direction. Keep living the way you're living and be encouraged that God is cheering you on to keep doing the right thing. If, on the other hand, 
we see what is expected of us and we aren't living that way, we have the opportunity to make adjustments. And Paul gives us three basics of Christian behavior to help us. The first thing he gives us is this. Don't let desire dominate you. Don't let desire dominate you. Look at what Paul says in verse 12. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. One of the first things that Paul speaks about is the danger of allowing our freedom to be abused. When Jesus died for our sins, we were given a restart of our lives. The proverbial chalkboard of our lives had all kind of things written on it was erased and God gave us a brand new clean slate to write on it things that are righteous and things that are beneficial to our living. He gave us a restart. He washed us in his blood. He cleansed us of all unrighteousness. And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible reminds us that really when you think about what Jesus did, nobody else could do it. Yes, there came along in the life of humanity people who lived good lives, but nobody lived the perfect life that Jesus lived. Even Moses had his flaws. Noah had his flaws. Rebecca had her flaws. Deborah had her flaws. Rachel had her flaws. Esther had her flaws. Peter had his flaws. And Paul had his flaws. And certainly David had his flaws. But when it came to Jesus, he was flawless. He was spotless. He was the unblemished Lamb of God come to take away the sins of the entire world. And he gave us a restart, gave us the opportunity to start our lives brand new. Everything we had done in the past was forgiven and we were empowered to live better lives knowing that the love of God saved us from eternal death. According to Paul, the danger, however, in having that freedom is that we can abuse it. I remember uh, very vividly uh, my sisters, of course, because of the age difference at a certain part in our growing up, had all gone away to college or had moved out of the house and started careers. And at a certain age, uh, I was in high school and there were no other siblings. And my parents were going to go out of town one weekend to a legislative retreat. And I had the freedom of the entire house to myself. I had the freedom to wake up when I wanted to wake up, to go to bed when I wanted to go to bed. Uh, I had so much freedom that I sat there contemplating what I would do until they got back. And I want to use this as an illustration to show you that sometimes too much freedom can be a bad thing. Because what Paul is saying is, don't let your freedom put you in bondage to ideas and desires in your mind. Paul says there's a danger that there are things that are sinful and then there are things that are weighty. And oftentimes the things that are weighty get us in more trouble than the things that are sinful because we rationalize in our minds, well, it's not a sin, and so I can do it. We rationalize in our minds, and we, and we go through God's Word, and we try to find if what we're contemplating is a sin, and we say, I don't see what I'm thinking about anywhere in God's Word as a sin. I must have the freedom to do it, but that's where Paul says, no, that's where we make our mistake because we can find ourselves having too much freedom we can easily see those things that are sinful and avoid them, but the weighty things are hard to say no to because they are not totally sinful. Paul warns us to avoid these things because what is weighty can be as bad as what is sinful. When you get your paycheck, it's not a sin that after you give your tithe, after you give your offering, that you decide to spend all of the rest of your check on whatever you want to spend it on because it's your money. 
but it can be weighty. If you spend more than you should because you're expecting the check next week for the work you did this week, you're making a grave mistake because if you have an unexpected bill to show up next week before your check comes, you can find yourself in trouble all because you had so much freedom that you did whatever you want to do with your check because it was yours. Instead of saving some money, you decide to go ahead and splurge because after all, you've paid your tithe, you've paid your offering. There's no sin in spending all your money. Yes, but it's a weighty thing and if you're not careful, you can let your desire dominate you. If you find yourself in a disagreement with someone and you're unable to resolve the disagreement, there's nothing sinful about refusing to speak to the other person when the disagreement is over. But if you allow this kind of behavior to fester and to continue, what you may find yourself doing is developing the kind of behavior that ends up being sinful because your lack of communication, your desire not to speak to them, your desire not to acknowledge that they are another human being and at least greet them will soon turn itself into anger, and then what the devil will do is plant seeds inside you of jealousy and envy and disregard for them, and what you'll soon find you're doing is starting from not speaking to not even wanting to be around them, and then maybe even doing some things to hurt them. If you have friends that are prone to engage in activities that push the limits of what you consider healthy for yourself, but you can't really find the sinful nature of what they're asking you to do, so you engage in the same activities, you will soon find yourself letting your desire dominate you. Yeah, gossiping is not a sin. You're free to do it. But soon it'll become something that is sinful. Staying up all night during a work week is not sinful. But you won't be your best at work, even if it is virtual. Staying up all night and not doing your homework is not sinful. But if you keep on doing that, you'll soon find yourself failing the class that you're in, all because you took too much levity with your freedom. And so Paul says, don't let your desire dominate you. Don't let your freedoms become a hindrance or a prison for you because you will find yourself in bondage to your freedom if you allow just because you can do it to be the reason you do it. I didn't list everything, and so don't, don't get to the place you say, well, Reverend didn't call out what I do, so it's not a sin. No, I didn't have time to list everything because I only have this short time to preach this sermon. But I want you to understand that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. And Paul wants to understand that our freedom should never be taken lightly. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. There's an old proverb that says, you don't use a hammer to kill a fly because you might find yourself damaging what's under the fly. Don't use it just because you can. Don't do it just because you can. Don't say it just because you can. Don't think it just because you can. Don't go there just because you can. You and I cannot let our desires dominate you. We cannot allow our desires to control us. We cannot let the lie of the enemy come in and cause us to do something that goes from being weighty to being sinful. Our freedom that Jesus gives us should never be abused. We should always consider that our lifestyle can make our Christian journey easier or harder. Yes, God died for your sins. And yes, God died for my sins. But that does not give us license to go out and sin simply because we know that God will forgive us. Because what you will find yourself doing and what I find myself doing is allowing our freedom to dominate us. Worse than that, somebody else is watching you. Somebody else who may be weaker in the faith is trying to guide and govern their behavior by what they see you doing. So when they see you doing what you want to do because you're free to do it, they might find themselves trying to do the same thing and get themselves in trouble. So if for no other reason, don't do it because somebody else is watching you. The second point that Paul gives us for basic Christian behavior is that actions have consequences. Actions have consequences. 
Notice what verse 16 and 17 say. Do you not know that whoever is united with a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. To follow up on his teaching, Paul informs and reminds us that our actions do have consequences. Paul reminds us that our actions need to reflect the path we are choosing. The early illustration I give is that if you paid all your money on something else and did not save money for a rainy day, and then that bill you did not expect, did not know about shows up, your actions have consequences. Now you got to go and borrow some money from somebody else, or now you got to go without getting that thing in your house repaired or your car repaired, all because you didn't set aside any money to save. You didn't study for the test, you stayed up all night, and now you show up the next day and you fail the test. Maybe you lose your scholarship, all because you didn't take the precautionary tale, right? You stayed up all night, showed up to work late, left work early, now you've been fired from your job. Yes, your actions have consequences. And Paul wants us to understand that we have to be careful because our actions need to reflect the path we are choosing. If we want to walk with God and have our life on a path of righteousness, we have to unite our bodies with Jesus. Paul uses the example of what happens if we unite our bodies with a prostitute. Essentially, we become the prostitute. Yes, first we were walking with the prostitute. Yes, we were hanging out with the prostitute. And then next thing you know, we became the prostitute. And we need to understand something. Hear me very clearly. Prostitution isn't just limited to sexual activity of what prostitutes used to do. Some of us have been prostitutes for friends that have us risking our jobs by showing up late and leaving early. Some of us have been prostitutes to discrimination by allowing ourselves to ignore discrimination because we didn't want to get involved. Some of us have been prostitutes to peer pressure because we ignored the home training we had in order to gain friends. Some of us have been prostitutes to laziness because we feel we've done enough to achieve a level of righteousness but don't want to do any more. Prostitution comes in all forms because what it does is we unite with something that we think is not going to do damage to us because we're strong enough to overcome it. And then we soon find our behavior being the same thing that we said we'd never do. We allowed our guard to drop. We allowed our senses to be numb. We allowed our conscience to be ignored. And soon we find ourselves doing some things we never thought we'd do. Soon we find ourselves saying some things we never thought we'd say. Soon we find ourselves going some place we never thought we'd go. And soon we find ourselves seeing them, some things happen and ignoring them. All because we thought that it was harmful. I'm harmless, rather. We thought it's not that serious. It doesn't mean that much. It's okay. Yeah, but soon hanging out causes us to accept something. And then when we accept it, we then began to want to emulate it. And then we want to emulate it, then we began to cheer it on. But on the flip side, what Paul says is, if we unite ourselves with Jesus, then we can empower ourselves to do the right thing. Uniting with Jesus focuses our minds and spirits to think about our actions and the consequences. When we unite with Jesus, when we are united with Jesus, let me say it again, when we are united with Jesus, we aren't resisting temptation by ourselves. When we join forces, when we join our hands in God's hands, when we link arms with Jesus, when we join our spirits with God, we are not just resisting temptation on our own power, but now we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are now charged up with the power of Jesus. We are now embarking upon a new journey because the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of us. Our minds elevate to the level of where Christ Jesus is and our weaknesses are no longer dominating us. Jesus died to free us from the bondage of our flesh, controlling our every thought and action. And with his resurrection, we are assured that sin and death have been conquered and defeated. So now, let us unite with Jesus. Paul says, don't unite ourselves with our old personality. Don't unite ourselves with our old characteristics. Don't unite ourselves with our own actions. 
But now that we're new creatures, born again, unite ourselves with Christ, walk in the path with Jesus, walk along the same path with him, and unite ourselves, knit ourselves together, hand in hand, glove in glove, heart in heart, mind in mind, spirit in spirit. So when you wake up the next morning, it is Jesus right beside you. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you. When you're walking along your path, temptation is not just coming for you, but it's also coming for Jesus, and he empowers you to resist the temptation. You're not in the garden by yourself, but he walks with you, and he talks with you, and he tells you that you are his own. He gives you the power to resist temptation. He gives us the power not to let our desires dominate us, and when we walk with Jesus, we find ourselves with our shoulders pushed back, with our chins lifted up, with our chest stuck out because we're pride filled with Jesus and we know that we're not in the battle by ourselves. And that's what happens when we unite ourselves with Jesus Christ. We are then filled with this new power. And our actions are now geared towards satisfying him. Finally, Paul says that the basic Christian behavior to remind ourselves that our bodies are borrowed. Our bodies are borrowed. Early in our sermon, we looked at the subject of our freedom. Paul said, listen, don't take your freedom for granted. Don't just do it because you can. We remember that the foundation of salvation is that our sins have a price of death. When we give in to sin, even one time, we became a prisoner and forfeited our freedom. Our bodies were destined to a physical death and our souls to an eternal death. When God took on our sins with his death, we were freed, but our bodies were bought back with his blood. Say that again. When Jesus died for our sins through his death, we were freed, but our bodies were bought back with his death. This is so important for us to understand because it helps us with the decisions we make in our lives. You know, if you've ever bought anything from anybody, then you know that you should bring it back in the same condition that you got it. When you rent a car, uh, you know that they give you instructions that the gas needs to be exactly where it was when you picked it up. If you bring the car back on a half a tank and you got it on a full tank, they're going to charge your credit card because they're going to fill it back up to where it should be. If, however, you fill it up and bring it back, you get to return the car with no extra charges. If you rent an apartment or a house, then you treat it good knowing that it's not yours and that there's an expectation that when the owner comes to visit from time to time to inspect his or her property, they want to know it's in a good condition. Same thing applies to us and our bodies. We serve such a good God that he gave us freedom not just from sin, but also from the difficulty we had in keeping the law. Yeah, we hear so many people declare, this is my life, and I can live it like I want to. That's true. This is your life, and that is your soul and your spirit, but the body is not yours. God bought your body back when it was destined for hell. God bought your body back with the blood of Jesus. And some may say, I didn't ask for God to buy my body back. I didn't ask for God to help me out. That's true, and they, and they may be right, but the issue now is it's already done. And truthfully, everything God has done is for our best. You are not your own. I am not my own. This body belongs to God. Your body belongs to God. Your thoughts are not your own. Your life is your own, but your time is not your own. It is redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Your abilities, your gifts are not your own. God gave those things to you for you to use for his kingdom upbuilding. So let's be clear. Our bodies aren't our own. Our time isn't our own. Our thoughts aren't our own. 
Our gifts are not our own. So why in the world would we think that we can take what is somebody else's and treat it like we want to treat it? What in the world makes us think that we can take this body of ours and just mistreat it and not treat it like we borrowed it from God? Our bodies are borrowed. Well, what's that mean? That we should glory God in our bodies. We should glory and praise God in our actions. My words should glorify God. Your words should glorify God. My thoughts should glorify God. Your thoughts should glorify God. My actions should glorify God. And your actions should glorify God. And somebody may say, but yeah, but I have difficulty. I got situations. I got problems. I got troubles. I'm going to take you back up to point number two. God will help you if you unite with him. God will empower you if you unite with him. God won't leave you out there by yourself. Yes, you got some difficulties, but God will be in the fight with you. And that's why we glory today. That's why we celebrate today, because we're not in this fight by ourselves. That's why we say thank you, God, today. That's why we say hallelujah to God today. That's why we say praise God today from whom all blessings flow because we know that we're not in this fight by ourselves. Yes, this is God's body, and I want God to strengthen this body. Yes, this is God's mind, and I want God to cure this mind. Yes, this is God's heart, and I want God to clean this heart. Yes, these are God's arms, and I want him to use these arms to glorify his kingdom. Yes, this is God's mouth, and I want him to use this mouth to praise him. So we need to praise God from whom our blessings flow. We need to praise God with all of our actions because our bodies are borrowed. And I want to give God his body back after using it for building his kingdom. I want to return to God and say, Father, I've done my very best to use this body to build up your kingdom. And I want to hear God say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now let me make you master over many. Don't you want to give God this body back, having used it for God's kingdom? Don't you want God to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant? Don't you want God to empower you to do what he's called you to do? Don't you want God to reshape your mind? Don't you want God to clean your heart? Don't you want God to empower your spirit? If you want God to do that, tell him today, God, I want you to clean my mind. God, I want you to clean my heart. God, I want you to use this body for your glorification. Tell him right now, Lord, I want to praise you. God, I want to worship you. God, I want to serve you. God, I want to live my life to glorify you. I want God, when they laid me out and come to say goodbye for the last time, for somebody to say he lived a good life. I want God to rejoice in the life that I've lived. And I want you also to know that when you live your life and glorify God, when you unite with God and remind yourself that this body of yours is borrowed, you'll have the basics of Christian behavior. Then you'll know how to live your life. You won't let your freedoms dominate you. You'll know that your actions have consequences and your glory in the fact that God, yes, gave you this body, giving you a chance to lift him. Oh, isn't that a good thing that we know that God will help us? Isn't that a good thing knowing that God won't leave us out there by himself? Anybody out there glad that God won't leave you by yourself? Is there anybody watching that knows that God will be by you right every day by your side? Is there anybody watching that knows that God woke you up this morning, that God started you on your way? Is there anybody that knows that God has blessed you from the rising of the sun to the going down the same? Is there anybody that can testify to God's goodness in your life, that God has kept some things from you, that God kept some dangers from you, that God kept some things from you and allowed you to be blessed every day of your life? That's the God we serve. And that's the God that Paul wants us to remember as we go about our day and celebrate the life that God has lived us, given us. I hope that today you've heard the voice of God calling you, giving you a chance to come be part of his kingdom building. Maybe you were trying to figure out what path you should take in life, and God is speaking to you now. Maybe you've been getting pressure from friends to do things and you didn't want to do them. Now you've got real understanding of why you can't do it. This body is not yours. Maybe you were dealing with some situations and found yourself falling back into your old lifestyle. Don't unite with your old self, but stay united with Jesus. I hope that you have heard God's voice today, and I invite you to pray with me as we go to the Father in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you thanking you once again, Lord, 
Thanking you, God, for buying us back. Thank you, God, for bringing us back from the brink of destruction and sin. Thank you, God, for giving us a chance at a new life. Thank you, Lord, for reshaping our hearts and minds. Thank you, God, for the blessings you bestowed upon us. And thank you, God, for the reminder that our freedoms cannot dominate us. We thank you, God, for the fact that we are not in this battle by ourselves. But yet, oh God, we are in this fight with you and you are on our side. Somebody out there, Lord, has heard your voice and is coming back to you. Somebody, oh God, was, was waiting to hear from you because they needed direction in their lives. And so, God, we say thank you for speaking to them. Somebody, Lord, just needed to know that you loved them again. And we thank you, God, for reminding them of your love for them. God, we love you and we, and we praise you. God, we, we submit ourselves to you, God. We, we renew our vow to you, oh God, that this day going forward, we will be better than we were before. Bless us now, God, as our prayer in your son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. If that prayer was for you and you want to join God's church, we offer to you the chance to unite with Lee Chapel Amy Church. Just simply email us and we will have correspondence sent back to you via email about welcoming you into our family. Maybe that prayer was for you as you've been dealing with a situation. I pray that you will now see a breakthrough come in your life. Be rest assured, God is on your side, and he wants only the very best for you. Amen. Now let us turn our worship service over to Lady Leah Love as she announces our birthdays, anniversaries, and our upcoming announcements. Good morning, Lee Chapel. This week's birthdays include Mark Brown, January 17th, Clarice Lucky, January 17th, Calvin Lake III, January 18th, Reverend Troy Merritt, January 18th, Janet Naomi Williams, January 18th, Annie Price, January 19th, Adrian Austin, January 19th, Kofi Patterson, January 20th, Eloise Prim, January 20th, Cecilia Sawyers, January 20th, Joan Campbell, January 22nd, Deborah Jernigan, January 22nd, Sproul Driver Jr., January 23rd, and Samaria Turner, January 23rd. We send you lots of love and virtual hugs today. Happy birthday. All right. Thank you again, Lady uh, Love, for our announcements and birthdays and anniversaries. Speaking of birthdays, we want to congratulate uh, Tiffany and Mark Brown as they welcome baby girl Jordan Myla Rose Brown on January the 3rd, mother and father and, and baby and brothers are all doing well, so we continue to pray for them uh, in their journey. Amen. Also want to remind you that uh, we have finished uh, our budget process with the formulation of our church budget. You should be getting a emailed or mailed version of the budget very soon, and I want to comply with our disciplinary requirement that if we announce a church conference is done two Sundays prior to the meeting. So. I'm announcing now that we will have a church conference to approve, review rather, and approve our budget on February the 7th. That's the first Sunday in February. On Sunday, February the 7th, we will have our church conference to review and approve our budget for this year. Uh, we will not have our evening Bible study on this Wednesday. Uh, there are several activities going on and I want to give you the opportunity to participate in those activities. There is, of course, the inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Harris, and there are also some activities, there are gospel concerts and other things going on that day. So I want you to spend that day with your family and friends enjoying and uh, experiencing this history-making inauguration of President Biden and the first African-American uh, person of color Vice President of the United States. So we want to, again, give that chance to do that. So we will not have Bible study this Wednesday, but we'll follow back up for Bible study on the next Wednesday, all right? And I want you to also make sure that you observe the information for the Martin Luther King Jr. Day activities for tomorrow. There are no in-person activities. There is no march. Uh, there is no convocation in person it will be all virtual. And you should have gotten an email 
If you're on the church's email list serve, we'll also post information on the church Facebook page so you can go and click on the link to observe the MLK Day uh, activities for tomorrow. So I want you to be encouraged this week uh, as you go through the week that God is still with you, God is on your side, and you need not be afraid of what the day brings for you because God is certainly aware of everything coming into your life and he's going to equip you with everything you need to overcome all these obstacles. All right? So those are our announcements for this week. I want you to also be aware that we have, still have our prayer call on Tuesday and on Thursday and church school on Sunday. All right? Well, until next time, may God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer. Thank you.